Hi. So let's go ahead and, and get started with just my little time-wasting verbal intro before I do the reading quizzes. Uh, tests overall pretty much landed the way that I expected. Uh, there were a few surprises, both positive and negative, for me. I'm not going to hand your exams back because I have two makeup exams that I have to do at the end of this week. So if you want to see your exam, come meet with me during office hours and we can talk about it. But I'll keep the copy until everybody's had a chance to actually take the equivalent of the first exam and then I'll, I'll hand it back with solutions, okay? So uh, again, I'm not going to hand them back today. If you want your exam back, just come and talk to me during office hours. I'll show it to you. We can talk about it and then I'll actually hand it back next week after everybody's had a chance to do the first exam. Um, did everybody watch the lecture? Heck, I had people not in my class watching the lecture hoping to learn something. So that's on you guys. Right? I put something up on the social media and I get a bunch of hits. So, uh, Well, I'm going to build on that today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate some of the things that I blah, blah, blah about in the video lecture, actually using a camera and some actual capacitors. So um, I have some capacitors here today. These look really nasty and mean. But these are like pathetic little capacitors. They can barely hold charge. Uh, they're really weak. They're old. Uh, there's a, what's called a one farad capacitor back there. That's capable of holding one coulomb for one volt's worth of potential difference. That'll kill you. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about electric current in the human body as we go through the lectures this week, but it doesn't take a whole lot to kill a human being when it comes to the movement of charge through the body. And, uh, well, I'll even have some disturbing slash entertaining videos that, that we can look at, including a taser demonstration. So, yeah, Kathy? Uh, I just have a question about the homework. So, yeah. you said that we would have to like, essentially double the homework. Yeah, oh, I lied. I, I just wanted you guys to sweat it. Uh, oh, okay. You're done. So just do homework four. Homework four is due Thursday. Okay. I think I got everything updated on the course notes website last okay. night because it still had homework five as listed this Thursday. Yeah. The, the homework five will be next week. Okay. So, so everything just really proceeds. Good. It's like we skipped a week and then we just keep going. Okay. All right, so, so deep breaths. I'm allowed to lie occasionally as an instructor. You shouldn't trust everything I say. You should take my critical thinking course. Okay, who wants a quiz? Yay. I want a quiz. All right, fine. You're getting special paper done. <laughs> You're the lucky one. I think that's four. Okay, so flip the quizzes over, hand them down to the end of the row. I'll pick them up. Today we're going to use capacitors, and I'm going to demonstrate, this is for me as an experimental scientist, this is a lot of fun because I actually get to uh, show real things in the real world. Now these are a bit exaggerated, the capacitors that are, uh, that are in the you know, microelectronics, like in your phone and so forth, those are really tiny. Um, your screen is actually a great example of a, of a big capacitor. I mentioned this in the video lecture, but the touch screens of things like Android and Apple phones are what are called capacitive touch. And what that means is that they, uh, they sense changes in capacitance as your finger touches the screen. And based on those changes, it's able to convert that using software into position information. So uh, a couple of things that were introduced in the video lecture, um, we're going to use a lot of symbols going forward as we talk more and more about circuits. So you should really think about this as building up a Lego-like toolkit of pieces that you can string together and do stuff uh, schematically. So this is the schematic symbol for a battery. It can have, uh, it usually has at least one large plate and one small plate. And the large plate may or may not be labeled plus. I'll try to be consistent about that, but remember that the longer of the two plates is supposed to be the one that is the source of positive electric charge. And a battery's job in an ideal situation is to maintain a constant potential difference for its part of the circuit. So if all you ever remember about a battery is that it's a source of electric field, that electric field doesn't change in strength in any appreciable way, and that sets up a constant electric potential difference across the terminals, the ends of the battery, that's about all you really need to remember about batteries. So that's what those batteries are doing in your phones, your watches, your uh, keyboards, your mice, your laptops. Their job is to maintain as much as possible a specific constant electric potential difference across the entire device. Now there may be changes inside the device in electric potential, but because electric potential is just another way of saying work per unit charge done in this case by the device, 
<coughs> and energy is conserved in a closed system, any changes in electric potential inside of the circuitry of, let's say, the laptop, all those changes should sum up to the big change across the battery. Otherwise, energy is not conserved. Catherine, um, yeah. I just have a general question about the sure. capacitor. So when you change like the, um, the area or the distance yeah. between the two, right. I don't, I'm not sure how you could increase the amount of charge stored on the plates because if there's a fixed voltage, wouldn't it have to stop it at some point? Well, that's the feature of the capacitor, right? So, so yeah, it does. Okay, so a couple of things. I haven't gotten back to the capacitor yet, but I'll jump ahead here. Uh, the, the capacitor is, is a device, right, with a physical geometric area on which charge can be stored, and those are the plates. Okay, so the top plate and the bottom plate. And the idea is that there's an uncrossable gap in between the plates. There's no way for a charge, unless you tear the material apart inside the capacitor and turn it into a perfect conductor, there's no way for, let's say, a positive charge up here to get down here, jumping the gap. The only way it could do that would be to move back through the circuit somehow, through the battery, and then go to the other side. Okay. So why is it that the amount of charge changes as you change, the, say, the distance between the plates or the areas of the plates? Uh, it, it really has to do simply with the fact that the source of the electric field here is a surface charge density. And so if you increase the, the area, you can increase the amount of charge to maintain the surface charge density and keep the electric field constant. So the, the, the electric field in the circuit, the one that the capacitor will eventually mimic and oppose, is driven by the battery. So that's creating an electric field. So in response, once you hook a capacitor into that and charge starts moving in the circuit, then this will slowly build up an electric field and eventually that electric field will reach the same magnitude as this one and oppose it and no more charge will move. There will be no net electric field left in the circuit. So does that just mean that the, um, the voltage that accumulates on the capacitor, that that happens more quickly? or? It can, yeah. So by alter, well, if you alter the capacitance of a device, you can alter the speed with which it charges up. Okay, so we'll get to that eventually. Okay. We're not there yet. Okay, so if there's a greater area, it can store more charge, which means that it will become um, the same voltage as the battery more quickly. It could, okay. yes. Yeah, we'll explore the ta what's called the time dependence of the capacitor in a bit. Right now, what I just want you to focus on is that you plug it in, you walk away, you come back a little while later, and whatever that little while is, it's enough for all the charge to have moved, gotten to the point where it's separated, opposed the voltage of the battery, and now there's no more motion. And then we're analyzing the circuit under that situation. So this is what's called uh, a static analysis. Okay, there is no flow of charge. There's no electric current that you have to worry about right now, but we're about to get into that. Okay, so that's sort of leading a little bit, but it's, it's a good sneak preview of what's to come. Okay. But, but right now, I mean, if you go back to the beginning of the capacitor video lecture, I, and I talk about the electric field from a disk, and that disk could be, a, it could be a, a circular disk, it doesn't matter, it could be a square disk. I chose the circle just because they talk about the electric field from a circular disk in your book. Um, if you look at, if you're very close to the disk itself, then there is absolutely no dependence on the strength of the electric field with height above the plate. It only depends on the charge density. And so if you, if you increase the area, you have to increase the amount of charge on there in order to maintain the same electric field, for instance. That's the only way that that will work. And, and that, again, that's all because of energy conservation. Mm -hmm. In order to conserve energy in the system, the only way to do that is to move more charge until there's enough charge that it can oppose the voltage of the battery and it stops. And that's it. And you reach what's called an, e well, an equilibrium situation. There's no more movement. Uh, Jenna? Yeah? Yeah. Um, if you have a capacitor and you're increasing the distance, doesn't the charge stay the same? Because it's not going anywhere. You're just kind of moving. If you, okay, so, okay, let's, let's, let's go and look at the capacitance equation. All right, so capacitance is uh, A over D, epsilon naught, and then there's this kappa, which comes from changing the material inside the capacitor. Mm -hmm. I didn't write this equation explicitly in the video lecture, but it's, it's such a simple modification of the original parallel plate capacitor system, and this is for parallel plate. Okay, where this is the area of the plates, that's the separation. So if you keep the area fixed, okay, and you, and you do something like increase the separation of the plates, the capacitance decreases, okay? 
So since uh, the amount of charge is equal to C times V, okay, if the voltage across the capacitor is fixed by the battery, and that doesn't change, and the capacitance decreases, the amount of charge stored will also do what? Decrease. Decrease, right? Because if C goes down and V is constant, Q must go down. So in fact, as you change the separation between the plates in that little simulation I showed you, it does that. It puts more or less pluses or minuses on the plates. So it really does affect the amount of charge. Basically, as you, as you decrease the separation of the plates, in order to get that same strength electric field in between the plates, you don't need as much charge anymore because the charges are getting closer. So the strength of the electric field can be maintained by having less charge. So as you decrease the plates, charge will actually move back through the battery to the other side, again, until you reach equilibrium, and then it will just stop. And it will reach just the static situation where nothing is moving anymore. Okay, now if you disconnect the battery and plug the ends of the capacitor into each other, which I'll do, you can get the charges to move back again until everything neutralizes one more time and you're right back to where you started. Neutral capacitor that you could charge up by putting a battery across it. And I'll do that, okay? Actually, let's do that. So this is not a parallel plate capacitor. It's sort of a three-dimensional parallel plate capacitor. This is a cylindrical capacitor. And what has basically been done is that conducting sheets of material have, have had some kind of dielectric material put in between them so that they can't make physical contact with one another. And the dielectric material is not a conductor. It doesn't allow charge to move freely through its volume. So you just take a big sheet of this, maybe long but, but thin, and you, you put your conductor down, you put your dielectric down, you put your conductor down on top of that and make a little sandwich, like an ice cream sandwich, and then you roll it. And that's what you get. So you can, you can put a lot of area in this little volume because you've taken a really long thing and rolled it into a cylinder. You know, much like you do with paper as a kid or something like that. If you, have, you get a poster or something, you want to store it more easily. You roll it up and you put it in a tube. Same idea. Okay, so that's all this is. Uh, this is a particularly unimpressive, uh, I guess this is going to be 4,000 millifarad. So, so this is a, well, you'll see. This is a little bit better than this 10,000 microfarad one. So they use funny units like this. Uh, micro and millifarad are sort of the things that engineers like to work in. And so they'll put these really big numbers next to milli and micro to indicate the size of the capacitors. Uh, except when you get to a farad, then they just write a farad capacitor on it. The one farad capacitor we have in the back, which is capable of storing, um, I guess this is 4,000 microfarad, actually. So this is 4,000 microfarad. Uh, this is capable, it's capable of storing, you know, something like a, a thousand times more charge than this. Is actually about, it's the same area here, but it, it's only about this thick. So, uh, you know, this is an old one. Uh, the joke used to be when the new grad student in the 1960s or 1970s joined the group, you'd send them into the storage room in the back to look for a one farad capacitor. Because back then a one farad capacitor would take an entire room. But technology has marched on since then, and that's not really a funny joke anymore. And actually, I would be very loath to let anyone handle a one farad capacitor charged. I once did, and I welded a, I, I actually, I accidentally, I was told not to do this, but I did it because it was an accident. I was working on the leads of the capacitor, and I shorted them. And when I did this, all the charge on one side of the capacitor is now free to go back to the uh, other side of the capacitor, and it welded my screwdriver to the leads. I could now no longer remove the screwdriver, and I just had to throw the whole thing down on the table and get away for fear of it melting or exploding. Um, it's very bad to do what's called shorting an electric device. That is where you create a path of almost no resistance between lots of charge, because charge is going to do what it, what's needed to do to neutralize the system again. And that may mean melting metal and then now creating a permanent short that you can't undo anymore. Uh, and then this can explode. So that's also very bad. One farad capacitor is blowing up or like bombs going off. And I can probably find some demo video of that, but there's plenty of stuff on YouTube. Usually if you're going to short a one farad capacitor, you put bulletproof glass up first so that no one gets shrapnel through their head. It's bad. Okay, so if you're in lab and you're given a one farad capacitor, hand it back to the person who gave it to you and said, no, thank you. <laughs> it's much better that way. All right. All right, so let's charge one up. Okay. I have a, what's that? Yeah, so if Dr. Gar if uh, Mr. Garino hands you a one farad capacitor, walk away. That's the best advice I can give you, okay? It's a trap. Get out. <laughs> All 
All right, so I have this uh, 10,000, so this is a 10 millifarad capacitor, and it's got a labeled plus side, although it, it really doesn't matter what side I hook up to plus, what side I hook up to minus. This is just to, you know, so engineers don't screw things up. So it's got a plus side on this side and a minus side on that side. And I have here a voltmeter, so let me, uh, let me bring this thing to the front. Okay, so how many of you have seen a voltmeter before, or an ammeter, a current meter? Okay, a few, more than a few. Great, okay, so this shouldn't come as a shock to you. This device is, this is actually a multimeter. It has uh, many settings on it here, and I've got it set so that it can read up to 20, a potential difference of 20 volts across a system right now. And my system is going to be this DC direct current power supply. Okay, so it has a little dial on it, which I'll hold up here because I can't get everything in frame. It's got a little dial. It's set to zero right now, but I can increase this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook the negative end in here and the positive end in here. And then no shorts, no metal near that. Okay, and I'm going to switch on the power supply and absolutely nothing interesting happens. This is just noise in the meter. There's always an uncertainty in these devices and it's usually in that last decimal place on the meter. So you shouldn't really trust that last number as it kind of flicks around. But I can actually give it a voltage to measure. So if I raise this a little bit, you see I can get this up to about one volt or so. And if I keep going, I'm gonna take this up to about 12 volts. So I'm gonna crank it up past 11. There we go, so 12 and, 12 and a third volts, roughly. So that's about the equivalent now of a 12 volt battery. So uh, 12 volt batteries are roughly what you find in cars, right? So your car has a 12 volt battery and it, granted that's a lead acid cell battery or something big like that. It has to be able to deliver a honking amount of power, power to start a gas engine, power your radio, your other electronics, uh, you know, charge up your devices plugged into the, what used to be a cigarette lighter, but now it's just called the power outlet. Okay. Um, so this is now roughly equivalent to the voltage across a car battery. Great. Well, now, uh, that's nice. Uh, all I'm doing is I'm measuring the electric potential difference across the terminals. So nothing really exciting is going on here. Uh, what I'm going to do now, however, is I am going to hook this power supply, let me switch that off, into a capacitor. And we'll select silver here. So silver is uh, 10,000 microfarad. Okay. And we'll go up plus to plus, although this part doesn't really matter so much. Plus to plus, minus to minus, okay. And now if I switch this on, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure the electric potential difference again across the power supply. So what should that be? 12. 12, it should be 12 volts. It's still delivering the same voltage it was before. So I'll just hook that, uh, let's see, here and here. Okay, and we see again, about 12.3 volts, okay. Now, if I measure the voltage difference across the capacitor, what should I measure? Ah, anyone? What's going to be the electric potential difference across the capacitor now that it's hooked into this battery or power supply? Well, that's the capacitance. That's its ability to store charge, which is proportional to the voltage. But what's the voltage going to be? I heard it from somewhere. No? I thought it was yeah. just yeah, it'll be 12 volts, not a trick question. Energy is conserved in the system. There's no other source of energy in the system. So the potential, once this thing is charged up, the potential difference across it has to be the same as the potential difference across the power supply because that's the only source of energy in the system. So this is just energy conservation and I'm gonna really just kind of hammer this in, okay? There are two major things you need to think about when you're analyzing systems like this and they're all based on conservation laws. Conservation of charge, that is, the, the net charge in the system has not changed. It's just been separated into different places, like across the plates of the capacitor. And the, the energy conservation, that the changes in potential difference in the circuit will net to zero overall. Okay, that is, energy is conserved. Okay, so let's measure the potential difference across the capacitor. Oop, let's go this way. 12.3 volts. Okay, so we can test this. We can test this claim based on energy conservation and charge conservation, specifically here, energy conservation, that the voltage, the electric potential difference across the capacitor will be the same as the battery, and so it is. Okay, now here's the neat thing about capacitors. If I disconnect 
the power supply, I can switch it off. Okay, the leads are now over there. What's the electric potential difference going to be across the capacitor when I measure it now? It's been disconnected from the power supply. Same. same. Should be the same. Or roughly the same, and you'll see. Okay, so it's a little lower. Why is it a little lower than it was before it was plugged in? And what's happening to it as we sit here and watch it? Yeah. Yeah, so it's not a perfect closed system. There's always some leakage, right? In a, in a real world system, there's no device invented that perfectly prevents charge from moving. Uh, there's a little bit of leakage of, of charge off the end of the, the, the lead here, for instance, into, well, let's see if I can get in here. So these leads are exposed to the air. There are water molecules in the air. Humidity has a way of soaking up additional charge. So if any of the charge is being sopped off of this metal by water vapor in the air, then sure enough, this is eventually going to drain down. Even the material inside is not perfect at preventing the motion of charge. But it's not bad. I mean, we've been sitting here now for about a minute, and it's lost about two volts of electric potential difference across. Okay. So what happens if I short this puppy? It drains completely. Okay, there we go. Let's measure it now. I know it's not supposed to explode, but there's no way I'm gonna go explain that to my spouse today. All right, so we've got it down almost to zero now. Okay, so that's one capacitor. Now, what happens if you have multiple capacitors in a system? This is where things seem to get tricky, but if you keep charge conservation and energy conservation in mind, it's really not quite as bad as it looks. All right? So what would happen now if I created a circuit involving a battery and two capacitors that looks something like this? All right? So I have my battery, the plus side and the minus side, and I'm going to start with two capacitors in what are called parallel to one another. So again, all these lines in between the devices are meant to be perfect conductor. They offer, as you'll see in a bit, no resistance to the flow of motion of charge. That's an approximation. There are perfect conductors that humans have learned how to make, but they're not cheap. So they tend not to be used in typical applications. But there are very good metals that you can rip out of the earth and refine, and they actually are pretty good conductors overall. They offer very little resistance to the flow of electric charge. So we have our battery, we have our two capacitors, and they may not even have the same capacitances. So we'll label them C1 and C2. Okay, so those are the capacitances of each of those capacitors. Now, without doing anything really novel here, we can simply write down a, a few bits and pieces. Okay? And I'll pilfer this, since anyway it's related to what I'm about to do. We have the voltage across the battery, V. Okay? We have the capacitance of capacitor 1, the capacitance of capacitor 2, and we know a few things. For any capacitor in the system, we'll label it I, the relationship between its capacitance, its voltage, and its charge is given by the very basic capacitor equation. That the charge stored on the capacitor plates on either one of them, the magnitude of that charge, is equal to a constant times the voltage across the capacitor. <coughs> All right, so there's going to be some potential difference across capacitor one. We may or may not know what that is yet. And there's some potential difference across capacitor two. We may or may not know what that is yet. But it does allow us to write down a few things. The charge stored on capacitor one is just C1 times V1. And the charge stored on capacitor two is C2 times V2. OK? Now, the name of the game with any circuit analysis problem, and this is where we're going to really begin circuit analysis. The name of the game is that when you have repeated components in a picture like this, your goal should be to try to reduce the number of components to the minimum number that you can get. So if you have multiple capacitors and they're 
connected in this case in what's called parallel. And I, and I hope you see why. It's because they're, they're in parallel next to each other, hooked up to the battery. Each uh, of these terminals is connected to the same plus end of the battery. Each of these terminals is connected to the same minus end of the battery. They're parallel to one another. Okay? So that's where this arrangement takes its name from. The goal with this or the other arrangement I'll talk about today is to reduce the number of capacitors to as few as possible by doing energy and charge conservation and using that to simplify the system. Okay? So, a couple of things here. Uh, we know that the charge on this plate is going to be plus Q1. And, oops, the charge on this plate is going to be minus Q1. And this is going to be Q2 and minus Q2. Okay, so we can begin jotting things down in the picture that are supposed to be true for the capacitor. And our goal is to write a single equation, Q total, that is the total charge stored in this system, is equal to some total capacitance, as if there was just one whopping capacitor in here, not two, times the total voltage across the system. So our goal is to start with the two separate equations and try to use energy or charge conservation or both and rewrite those two parallel capacitors as if they were one giant capacitor and figure out what C total is so that we can plug it into that bottom equation. Okay, so a couple of things uh, here. Let's think about electric potential difference. Let's start with energy conservation. You have the top sides of the two capacitors plugged into the same side of the battery at the same point in the battery, right? So if I was to put a, uh, a voltmeter here and here, so put the leads of the voltmeter here, what voltage would I measure? Yeah, the voltage across the battery, V. What if I put them here and here? Same. Same. What if I put them here and here? Same. Same. What if I put them here and here? Same. So my prediction is that because if I were to take a voltmeter and stick it here and here, it's equivalent to putting it here and here and here and here and here and here. I kind of did this in the, in the video lecture, right? The electric potential difference across these points will be the same here because there's a clear path back to the battery. There's a clear path with no other circuits, no other capacitors in the way back to the battery. So by energy conservation, whatever the electric potential changes across one and two are, they're the same. And since the only other source of potential in this battery, in this circuit is the battery, it has to be V. <coughs> so energy conservation rides to the rescue in this problem. So from that, energy conservation, we have the following. We have that V1 must be equal to 2, must be equal to V. That's a prediction. Let's test it. Okay, that's just math on a chalkboard. So I have two different capacitance capacitors here. One, 4 microfarad, or 4,000 microfarad. One, 10,000 microfarad. Okay, so they're different by almost a factor of 2. I have a source of potential difference, 12 volts here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hook these capacitors up in parallel. So to do that, I have to take the negative side of this one, and I have to hook it to the negative side of this one. Okay, And then I'm going to hook that to the negative side of the, let's see if I can do this not touching any other metal. That looks good. Okay. That goes to the negative side of the voltage source. Okay. Now I have the positive side. So I got to hook the positive side to the positive side. And let me just double check. Yep. Red plus. Good. Those are supposed to be the positive sides. And now I got to hook this up to the voltage source. So come on you. Okay, it didn't fall over. Good. That's all I can ask for. All right, so let me switch this on. Give it a second. Okay, so we can 
uh, very easily just check the, if I hook right into the, the leads of the power supply, okay, we can check the, oops, let me get my hand out of the way. All right. We can't see. The oh, <laughs> yeah, that would be helpful. Derp, to derp. There we go. Oh, that's terrible. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. All right, let me make sure I don't screw this up now. So, negative side of the battery and positive side of the battery. Okay. 12 volts. Well, that correspondingly also happens to be the voltage across this capacitor, right? Because it's, I have the battery voltage coming into this side of this capacitor. I have the battery voltage on the other side going onto this side. So touching the leads of these two capacitors, I get 12.3 volts. So let's see what happens over here. All right. So here we go. And 12.3 volts. Okay. So that's good. We have a prediction and it's actually born out in the real world. We have a device that's capable of holding charge. It's got plates separated by some dielectric material that doesn't allow charge to move. I put two of them in parallel. That is, I put them both uh, hooked into one side of the potential difference and both hooked into the other side of the potential difference so that they're effectively joined together like this and the voltage across them is the same. Great. So we can use this. We can use this. This prediction is real. So let's go ahead and use it. So we have uh, that uh, V1 and V2 are going to be the same. Uh, there is something else that we can use here. Okay. What's the relationship between the charge I put on capacitor 1, the charge I put on capacitor 2, and the total charge in the system that's been separated? How do I relate those? You can add them. And, and how? How would you add them? Um, just like, you wouldn't do like the reciprocal or anything? Uh, no, right. So you're just using charge conservation, yeah. right? So Q total must be equal to what? Q total minus Q. Sorry, I heard some starts and then some stops and then it faded out. So, Ethan? Would it be 2 times Q1 or 2 times Q2? No. Or wouldn't it just be Q1 plus Q2? Q1 plus Q2. Yeah, charge conservation is that if I have a charge stored on device 1 and I have a charge stored on device 2, the total charge stored in the system is Q1 plus Q2. So that's Q total. Okay, so that's, that's charge conservation. So Q total must also be equal to Q1 plus Q2. Okay? Well, now I can actually start using the capacitor equation. So I can, I can simply rewrite Q1. Well, actually, yeah, I can just plug this right in here, can't I? So this is going to be equal to C1 V1 plus C2 V2. Well, V1 and V2 are both equal to V. So I can just rewrite this again as C1 V plus C2 V. And now with a little bit more algebra, we have actually the exact equation we were looking for, Q total. We want to find out what C total is. V total is just the voltage across the battery. And that's just going to be C1 plus C2 times V. So for a system of parallel capacitors like this, the total capacitance, so for parallel capacitors, C total is equal to C1 plus C2. Nice easy equation. And again, it's all born out of energy conservation and charge conservation. Okay, so that's one example. And you can use that in homework. You know, you'll be given some awful looking set of capacitors in parallel, all with different capacitances, and be told, find the equivalent capacitance of this mess, C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus whatever, if they're all in parallel. Okay. Where the tricky bits come in is when you mix parallel with what we're going to do next, which is called series. So we'll do series on its own, and then I'll leave the homework to see if you've grasped the core concepts. Okay. So you're coming out of there. And then turn the charge off. Okay. So series is 
the one that I think people think is a bit more daunting. But again, if you remember, basically if you remember your training, if you remember energy and charge conservation, you'll be able to handle this no problem. And eventually it just becomes a couple of rules based on energy and charge conservation that you have to apply, apply, apply. All right, so here we have our capacitors. Now this is what is called series. So series is that you have uh, one capacitor in the circuit that's in front of, or behind of, depending on how you want to look at it, another capacitor in the circuit. So they're in sequence in the conductor path. So now, uh, again, you would expect that there's going to be some plus Q1 here, some minus Q1 here, some plus Q2 here, some minus Q2 here. There's going to be some potential V1 and V2. Uh, let me put a semicolon here so that those aren't multiplied. Okay, so you can just write that down. And then, of course, we have the voltage across the battery V. Yeah, Rachel. This might be just tedious, but no. um, on the other diagrams, I know you erased over that. Um, you only wrote like plus Q1 or plus Q2. You mm -hmm. didn't write minus Q1 and minus Q2. I did. You did? Uh -huh. Okay, I just yeah, that. They're on the other place. It was just on the other, okay. Yep, yeah, yeah, so if, uh, because the, the top of both capacitors was hooked into the plus side of the battery, both of those are plus Q1 and plus Q2, so the okay. bottom sides are minus Q1 and minus Q2. Okay. That's all. Sorry. Okay. No, 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 it's a good question. All right, so this one we have to analyze as well. And let's start with energy conservation again. So, again, if I put a voltmeter on the system here and here, I'm going to get... V. v, the voltage across the battery. Here and here? V. v. Okay. What about here and here? Am I going to get V? Should be. So, okay, so we have, okay, so, so, so some prediction. That's going to be the same voltage as the voltage across the battery? Okay. Any other, other predictions? It's going to be half. It'll, well, you think it'll be half? Well, different. It's certainly different than V. I mean, half is, uh, is a bit specific. We'll, we'll see. But, uh, or like, Proportional to C. Yeah, somehow related to yeah. the C's and how they relate yeah. to one another, something like that. Okay, all right. So we have a prediction, one that this is the same voltage as the voltage of the battery, and one that this is something other than that that's related to the capacitances. All right, let's, let's check. So again, I have capacitors. So I have, this time, I'm going to hook the minus side of one of them into the plus side of the other, so you are my victim for this one. Okay. And let's see, so this is the plus side of the power supply. This will go here, don't fall. Okay, and then this is the minus side, everything's off. This will go here. Okay, so now I have so the series configuration, I have, let's go from the, uh, the plus side here. So plus side hooks into the plus side of this capacitor. The minus side of this capacitor goes into, there's a little plus right here. You can, actually, you can kind of see it in the image, actually, thanks to that reflection. Uh, and then the minus side over here goes to the power supply. So just like in this picture here. All right, so now I will uh, switch this on. Okay, so we can, do, we can check the first thing, right, which is that the voltage across both capacitors had better be the same as the voltage of the, across the batteries. So let's do that. So here's one end of the system, and here is the other end of the system. 12.3 volts. Okay, now let's check the next part. So what I'll do first is I'll measure the voltage difference across the black capacitor and then the silver one. Okay, so all I have to do is put this here. And put this here. Ah... Six volts, okay? And then let's check this one. So this is the plus side of this one. Now, what do I expect the voltage across this one to be? Six. About six volts, yeah. Yeah, the other one was 6.3 something. This is 5.9 something, okay? All right, so they're slightly different. And that's, oh, yeah, Catherine? Oh, sorry, so how did you set this one up differently than the parallel, so what did you mm. Yeah, okay, so in the parallel plate system, let me see if I can uh, show this here. All right, so in the parallel system, what you do is you connect the, s the lead, let's say, from one side of the power supply or the battery to the same uh, 
sides of the capacitors. So this uh, plus lead should also go to the plus side of this capacitor in parallel. But here it doesn't. Here the plus only goes into one of them, then the side of one capacitor is connected to the plus side of the other, and then the negative side of the power supply connects to uh, this capacitor. So rather than both of them feeling the voltage from the negative part of the power supply and the positive, only one of them gets the voltage in from the positive side and only one of them gets the voltage out to the negative side. Okay, so that's why they share the potential Yeah, exactly. So you, when you go across this capacitor, you experience some potential difference V1. Okay, in this case, it was about, let's see, 6.3. <coughs> okay, 6.5. Again, there's a little bit of measurement error here just because this is a, not an imperfect device. So 6.52 or so. And then over here, it should be less, and it's 5.68, something like that. And the sum of those two should be about 12.3. Okay. So, all right, so we had a couple predictions, and this is the beauty of experiment, is you can test predictions and see which ones are reliable and which ones are not. And so we, we now we know which one's unreliable. It's the one where they both have the same voltage in this configuration, but the reliable one is where they have different voltages. Rachel? Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this. So you yeah. just hooked up two capacitors to each other? Mm -hmm. Like those block those Yeah, the so how does back end of one goes into the front end of the other, and then they each connect to the power supply separately. Because the power separately. supply is the battery? Yes, the power supply is our battery. It okay. maintains a constant voltage of 12.3 volts. Yep. Okay. You can do this with a 9-volt battery. You can do this with a 1.5-volt battery. You just get different voltages in that case. So, so positive in to negative in capacitor to capacitor, 12.3? Uh, across the whole capacitor system? Yeah, just one. Basically the like this to this. Line. That's 12.3. Now, and I assume the inside one, like the midline. So oh, if I do this? That one, but to the other one. So to I was trying to get what the, the mid, the connector. Oh, here to here? Yeah. That's a good question. Nothing. Okay. Zero. Because there is no battery in between the path connecting these two points. Yeah, so there is, so that's, that's good. That means the conductor isn't providing any additional electric fields that we have to worry about. Okay. Yeah, so that's a great question. Yeah, what exactly, that would be the same as me, you know, taking this, this bit of wire and hooking the voltmeter into itself. I'd expect zero volts because there's no source of electric field anywhere in here. Yeah, Ethan. Uh, so voltage one equals voltage two, is that? Here? No. No. The equation for the series that we write down based on energy conservation is that V1 plus V2 equals the total voltage across the system. So here, unlike in the, so in the, in this parallel case, the total charge was equal to Q1 plus Q2. We'll get to charge in a second. In the series capacitor system, the total voltage is V1 plus V2. And you'll see this affects the total capacitance. This system has a different total capacitance than when you put the same capacitors in parallel with one another. Yeah? Um, so since these are in series, they, like, the capacitance would decrease, but why would you... We're not there yet. You're, you're, you're begging the question, but yes, what's that? I was just wondering yeah. why you would want to decrease the capacitance since the whole purpose is to store charge. Right, but uh, here's a, actually here's a great example. You're, you're, you're okay, you know, you're like MacGyver. You're locked in a room. You have two capacitors. Each of them is too large to solve the problem that you have. But if you could combine them in some way, you could reduce the total capacitance and you know, build a circuit that involves half the capacitance of the two you were given. Okay. So then it comes in handy to be able to cut the capacitance down in some way. Okay. Engineers have to do this all the time, right? You, have, you can't build a custom capacitor for every situation. But what you can do is you can combine capacitors to solve problems, okay. maybe in a prototype. You can always custom build it later. Right, but you don't want to have to custom build every little capacitor that you need. Exactly. Yeah. So, do you necessarily need the mid connector, or they just store ah. capacitors anyway? That's a that's a good question, right? So, actually, let's let's look at the charge, and then we'll we'll think about that question. Okay. So we have a charge Q positive Q one here, negative sign but same magnitude, negative Q one down here. We have positive Q two here and negative Q two here. But let's think about this picture right here. You've got this plate with negative Q1, and you've got this plate with positive uh, Q2. So uh, what must be the relationship between Q1 and Q2? Is this charge moving? Let me, let me start with that question. No, the charge is sitting on the plates. It's not going anywhere. What would happen if Q2 were bigger than Q1? 
what would the charges on Q1 do? Move. They'd move, right? And then so this thing would keep reshuffling charge. So these must be equal. Yeah, equal in magnitude but opposite in sign. Right. So what's happened here is that you put this potential difference across these two ends of different capacitors. And, and you start depositing positive charge up here, okay? So maybe you, you, put, you start by putting just a little bit of positive charge on the top plate and a little bit of negative charge down here. And in response, this material in between, which also begins as electrically neutral, it feels a little electric field from this charge and this charge, and its charges separate. And so they separate in equal amounts. And so whatever the charge is, positive Q1 here, uh, it's also the same as the, the plus Q2 here. So from charge conservation, Q1 equals Q2, and that's going to be equal to Q total this time. So unlike the parallel system, the total charge in the system is equal to the charge stored on either of the capacitors. Okay, and so from this, we can begin to solve. So let's do that. So we have this equation. And again, these are for, I should have written this down first, series capacitors. So these are in series. They're in sequence in the circuit, one after the other. We have two equations. We have uh, this equation from charge conservation and this equation from energy conservation. And so we can begin to substitute in with our uh, capacitor equation. So let's go ahead and do that. So V total is going to be equal to, let's see, V is going to be equal to, Q total all over C total. And V1 is going to be equal to Q1 over C1. And V2 is going to be Q2 over C2. Okay? So I'll leave those. Get rid of this. And again, you can always write down a capacitor equation for every single individual capacitor in the circuit. And that's the first thing you should do when you have to tackle these problems, is just start with the fact that every single capacitor in the system will have its own capacitor equation. Q1 equals C1V1. Don't worry about what Q1 is, don't worry about what V1 is yet, just write it down. Write down a, an equivalent equation for every other capacitor. And then you want to start thinking about, well, which ones are in series with one another, which ones are in parallel with one another, and then how can I combine capacitances? So let's do that here. Okay, well, we have the energy conservation equation. So we have uh, V equals V1 plus V2. And if we substitute in with our capacitor equation, we have Q total over C total equals, and again, substitute in with our capacitor equation. So we have Q1 over C1 and Q2 over C2. And we're almost there. We have to now use this equation. The Q1 is equal to Q2 is equal to Q total in this situation for series capacitors. Well, we've got Q total here. Q1 is the same as that. Q2 is the same as that. So what happens to the Qs on all sides of the equation? They all cancel, right? And we're left with, for the series case, this equation, one over C total, is equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. And so then you would you know, put in your C1, do 1 over that, put in your C2, do 1 over that, add them, and do 1 over the result to get C total. So you have to invert this equation eventually to get C total. And then in parallel, let me write down the result we got from that. So in parallel, we had C total equals C1 plus C2. Okay? And that's it. Every circuit that you can design is basically going to have capacitors either in series or in parallel in some way. And so the goal that you'll be put through in homework, not this, not homework four, but in homework five, will be to try to reduce a complex looking circuit down to a single large capacitance. Why is this useful? Um, a good example of this is analyzing the action potential of a neuron. Right, so the neurons in the brain, they are uh, capable of holding a potential difference of about what? Does anybody remember? Negative 70, yeah, negative 70 millivolts. 
And what happens is that when you want to uh, transmit information through the axon, it actually causes a, a decrease of, or an increase of the potential, and then it falls, undershoots, and comes back to its original resting potential. The, that release of charge that causes information to move down the, the, the neuron, that release of charge is essentially modelable as a capacitor storage and discharge uh, uh, system. So I had a student in this class many years ago she went on to minor in physics, uh, Holly Howard. We have a poster down the hall where we tried to reproduce the action potential just using simple resistor and capacitor circuits. We were unsuccessful, which is good news because I would expect that the neuron is a bit more complicated than just throwing a few capacitors and resistors into a power supply uh, in a circuit. Um, but we learned a lot about how to try to sculpt the voltage from capacitors while we were doing it. Um, so this stuff has applications, for instance, in, in doing electrical analysis of information storage in the brain and how information is transmitted, uh, how the action potential is realized, how it's changed in a neuron. All of that be, can be controlled with, uh, uh, you can model, uh, actually, I believe this actually won a Nobel Prize, but there's a, an old now model of the uh, neuron and its action potential and how it changes that simply uses capacitors in a circuit to demonstrate it. And that's essentially what we were trying to reproduce in the lab, to see if we could actually get the, the behavior we saw. So questions? Doesn't. So how in the series is the Q1 and Q2 equal? I guess I'm confused from the parallel, yeah. although it be very equal. So uh, why, okay, why are the charges related to one another? All right, well, so uh, just ignore the bottom capacitor for a second, all right? Um, it certainly will be the case that if this was the only, if this top one was the only capacitor in the system, that once you build up enough charge, you can oppose the voltage of the battery, these charges will be the same magnitude but opposite sign, which gives you the electric field inside the capacitor, and then no more charge moves. When you add another one in, you're now putting the voltage across this entire system. So the battery, the battery voltage is over this entire pair of capacitors. So if you, if you just, one way you can analyze this actually is just to imagine what would happen if these plates were to move closer and closer and closer to one another and get thinner and thinner and third thinner. And eventually what would happen is that the negative charge on the top here and the positive charge on the bottom would come together and they'd merge and it would be as if you had one single capacitor with no plate in between. And so the only way that can happen is if these charges exactly cancel each other. Which they did, yeah. So, so plus Q1 minus Q1, this will also have to be plus Q1, and that will be minus Q1. That's the only way that you can keep charge from moving in the system once you've charged up the capacitors. Okay. The book may do a better job of explaining this than me, but they do this thought experiment where what happens is if you shrink the, bring these, these inner plates of the capacitors very close together so that you're basically melting their conductor together until all the charge is now sitting on one single block of conductor in between the plates here and here. And in that case, the charges, the negative charges and the positive charges are basically being forced to come back together and neutralize, and you get one big capacitor with a plus Q1 up here and a minus Q1 down here. Okay, yeah. so you like did those two examples to show how to find capacitance in the series and parallel Right, okay. exactly. Just sure. Yeah, and it was just using charge conservation that the net charge in the circuit starts zero, and it has to end zero, okay? And so the only way to do that would be if uh, uh, if we know that these two have to cancel each other, then it better be true that these two also cancel each other, or there's net charge left over in the system, and we don't know where it came from, right? Which would violate charge conservation. So that's another way to look at it, right? Uh, and then voltages have to add up. So uh, you have to look at this and figure out, well, are the, are the voltages across these capacitors going to be the same, or could they be different? I know that whatever happens in that system at the end, the total had better equal what's coming from the battery, and that's just energy conservation. Okay. So that's where all this comes. That's what allows us to analyze the system of capacitors in the first place. It's those two things, charge conservation, energy conservation. That's why they're so central to physics. Every. This is probably going to seem very elementary. Why does everyone preface a question with that? Go because what is the point? <laughs> What's the point? Yes. The, the, point, the point is that it, when you are designing electronics, you have to be able to figure out what the voltage changes are in the system 
and where the uh, charge is being stored and how much is being stored. All right. So as a simple example, uh, actually here's a great example. It does it using a slightly different technology, but the principle is the same. You go to Europe. How many people have traveled to Europe or outside the United States? Okay, you bring a hair dryer with you. Yeah. And it blew up, didn't it? Why did it blow up? Their circuits. Right, what's different about their circuits? There's an extra little nodule, like the plug is a little Okay, so mechanically they're different, but electrically, <laughs> what's different about them? Different volts. They use about 220 volts. So if I plug in a hair dryer, which is basically, it, it's just copper wire into a high resistor that, that then when it heats up causes heat and it's got a fan that blows the heat into your hair, okay? If I just plug that into a 220 volt outlet, I will melt the resistor inside of the hair dryer and it will either catch fire or simply electrically fail. So what you need to do is you need to change the voltage that's coming from the wall and then going across your hair dryer so it doesn't melt. Now the way that this is actually done is using something called a transformer and it's, it uses magnetism. But you could do it using capacitors. And in fact, this is done using capacitors and microelectronics. You have a battery. It puts out 12 volts. But you have a sensitive microprocessor that only needs one and a half. If you put 12 across it, you'll blow the expensive microprocessor up. So you need to devise a way to split the voltage, to turn 12 into one. And the way you can do that is you can change these capacitances until the voltage difference across this one is one and this one is 11. And then you can plug your microprocessor into this. Okay, so this is how the human body <laughs> regulates voltage, for instance. Right? So the, um, uh, you, know, we, you looked at a toy example using the cell membrane. Uh, but th you know, this, this business with using capacitance effectively to alter voltage is the basic working mechanism by which the brain works. It's the basic mechanism in physics by which cell membranes work and move charge uh, uh, across the cell membrane. And so you have to be able to analyze these systems in general because they're useful and you want to use them for something. Uh, nature's done it and there's no reason that we as part of nature shouldn't do it either. And it, it's a great advantage, right? I mean, the fact that I have a, uh, a microprocessor in here that can't take the full voltage of the battery is saved by the fact that I can use capacitances to drop the voltage down. So, yeah. What about uh, capacitors for stability? Right, so another thing, I mentioned this earlier, but uh, because you can keep a reservoir of charge here, if somebody were to maliciously disconnect your battery, right, uh, you, you don't necessarily want your computer to just beam, power off and you lose all your work, right? So there are capacitors in these devices anyway for a variety of other reasons, but they can be used to hold charge for just a few seconds, maybe just enough time to plug the battery back in or, or plug the wall plug back in before your computer completely shuts off. So you can use them for practical reasons like that, but there's a whole bunch of like circuit design reasons that you would want to do that in general to smooth out the amount of charge or current that's moving through a circuit. Uh, so capacitors are often used to regulate electric current so it doesn't fluctuate wildly in a circuit, which can damage microelectronics. Uh, so once the capacitors have drained, that's the point where you need to plug back in the battery and right. can restore the charge. Right, because they only give you a finite amount of time. And we'll right. look at how long that actually is. Okay. Uh, given the voltage and given the capacitance, you can determine how long it will take to discharge the circuit and, and the resistance of the circuit. So how much resistance does the circuit offer to the flow of charge? Okay. If you know those three things, you can figure out how long it'll, how long you have, basically. And yeah. then you said that, um, like in the processor, it can only hold the, or it can only handle. Yeah, microprocessors don't need a whole lot of voltage to so run. So once it uses the amount that it can have, like the um, capacitor like, gives it another like one volt or whatever it needs until like, the capacitor is drained. Right? Yeah. Well, it'll give it one volt right away, and then it'll be 0.99 volts a moment later, and then 0.97 volts, and then 0.92 volts, and it'll, dis it'll discharge according to a specific pattern that we'll see. You don't have a lot of time. It depends on how you designed your circuit in the first place. And if you designed it carefully enough, you might get seconds, which could be enough time to save yourself. The bigger problem is not so much what the microprocessor is doing, but what the memory in the device is doing. You know, when you're working on a document, if you're not saving it to disk, it's being stored in what's called RAM. And that RAM is volatile. If you disconnect power from it, the state of the memory is lost. I mean, in the same way that if you disconnect oxygen from your body, 
your brain death will occur within how long? Minutes, right? Eight minutes, ten minutes, something like that. You, you'd be a vegetative state uh, if you go without oxygen for too long. Same thing for electrons, uh, battery voltage or wall power for your computer. It has volatile RAM. That RAM requires voltage to maintain its current state, its memory. And if you pull power from it, you'll destroy the current state of the, of the RAM, which means you're losing your document. So you'll get data corruption at the very minimum and data loss at the very maximum, just utter data loss. So the way you can resolve that is by keeping a capacitor or bank of capacitors handy. Just in case something bad happens to the voltage across the RAM, the capacitors can come in and save it for a moment until the battery can kick back in again. So you're saying if there's like a low battery or something, because if it's yep. fully charged, then that shouldn't happen. Right. The right. The ability to store charge. Yeah. And it's a bit of a catch-22 because the battery is both storing charge in the capacitors and being used to operate your electronics at the same time. So as it begins to wear, it's, as its chemical reaction wears down, it can no longer maintain that voltage anymore. So it can no longer maintain current in the circuit, as we'll, we'll see. And that, that causes all kinds of problems. So that, that's when you begin to basically go into fail modes with electronics. You know, they just they can't maintain their screen power. They can't maintain their memory state. They can't maintain active processor calculations anymore. It's the equivalent of robbing you of oxygen. You will stop functioning very quickly. Within a minute, you'll be unable to move. And within a few minutes, several minutes, you'll be brain dead. And your organs will begin to shut down. So, you know, humans have oxygen and food. Uh, th those things have electrons coming from the wall. But the outcome is the same if you rob them of their power supply. You can't operate the electrical systems anymore. And they power down. And we're just a big bag of electronics. We're wet electronics. Those are dry electronics. Maybe one day they'll fuse and we'll be cyborgs. That'd be cool. <laughs> I could use more RAM, that's for sure. So, so with the Euro pair drive example, um, yeah. why do you have to bring those adapters? Because like, I brought one because I knew ahead of time good. that was yeah. not a good idea. Yeah, so well, I and, and I had to talk my spouse down off a cliff about not plugging her hair dryer into an outlet this summer. And I managed to win that, but only barely, because I knew what was going to happen when she plugged that in. She's a physicist. This makes no sense to me. Um, why? Because you need to transform the voltage into something that that hair dryer can actually handle. So what does it do? It what it does is it, it um, we'll get to what, what that kind of does later, but uh, the voltage comes in one side, and there's a, a big wrapping of wire inside of it around a magnet. And the uh, current in the, uh, from the wall plug creates a magnetic field inside of the device, so energy is now stored in that field, and you can induce a voltage on the other side of this device that's less than the one that comes in by robbing energy out of the electric field again. In that, and this is called a transformer. In that little transformer that you bring yep. out of it, you plug That little thing that hums and gets really hot. Right. The reason it hums and gets really hot is because- It's taking that charge that it- Yeah, and storing it in like heat. It. It's, it's wasting energy in heat as it transforms the voltage, but it's primarily storing energy in a magnetic field. So rather than an electric field, which is how this stores energy, there are devices called transformers that store energy in a magnetic field. So it turns electrical energy from the wall into magnetic energy in right. the transformer right. thing? Right. And, and then, then it turns that back into, into less voltage. Right. right. Cool. Yep. So that's why they get hot, and that's why they tend to fail, is because uh, to do that requires that a lot of work happen in the device, and that results in heat friction from because of the resistance in the material. And that, I mean, those adapters tend to only last a, a few years worth of regular travel. You have to buy a new one because they, they just, it just melts. Well, if you're not going to Europe every day, you're probably. Not. Yeah, unfortunately, I go several times a year, so I burn through those things ridiculously fast. But yeah. My well, hair dryer is yeah. still blue when I use an adapter. Uh, maybe the adapter was bad. Huh. Or it's possible it transformed to the wrong voltage. Yeah. I just bought a European. Yeah, they do have switches on them. That's right. Yeah, there's actually usually yeah, some of the really good ones will let you switch between voltages. So. But um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. It could have been that thing was ready to fail to begin with, or it could have just been that you happened to be unlucky and, and had a, a transformer that failed or was bad when you bought it. That's the risk, right? <laughs> if it's not well designed, then it could just fail right away. So. Just European. Yeah. Be <laughs> yeah, just to I be was safe. Scared. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and, and I mean that can that can cause fires. It's really bad. I mean, obviously, you don't want to to do that because uh, uh, it will cause problems. Right. So. This is just to illustrate the kind of thing that you're going to see on homework, right? So you'll be given some problem involving multiple capacitors in parallel or just in series or both. 
Okay, and your goal will be to try to get that circuit into an equivalent circuit with only a single capacitor in it, and you have to figure out what that equivalent total capacitance is. That's the game you'll be playing, all right? So that's an example of three in parallel. That's an example of three in series. And you should always start by analyzing them pairwise. So take one pair, try to compress it into a single capacitor. Now use that paired with the next one, try to compress that into a single capacitor, and keep going. It's a stepwise process. It's just like solving problems involving you know, electric fields and many charges. Break it into pieces, attack each piece one at a time, and then build it up to a big thing. Okay. So same strategy as always. Uh, one last comment I wanted to make, and then I'll, I'll do a brief introduction to current before we get into Ohm's Law, join the resistance on Thursday, all right? Uh, my goal is to make that joke even moder moderately funny to any of you, all right? Uh, energy capacitors, all right, dielectrics and capacitors. So uh, I mentioned in the lecture that you can shove material into the capacitor. You saw that demo using the simulation where you take the block of material and you shove it, it was glass, and you shove it into the, the capacitor, and the capacitance goes way up. Uh, you, there are all kinds of materials that we've developed over long periods of time that turn out to have various what are called dielectric constants. Uh, if I write the capacitor equation uh, one more time, or the, uh, yeah, the parallel plate capacitor. So for a parallel plate capacitor, this is equal to A over D epsilon naught kappa. And this thing here is the dielectric constant. Okay, and so that's just a number. It's always one or greater than one. Uh, one corresponds to the vacuum of space, empty space, no material at all anywhere. Um, anything else has a larger dielectric constant that you can't be more permeable, permeable than the vacuum. The vacuum perfectly permits electric fields to propagate. Other materials do not, and I'll show you why from the atomic perspective in a moment. All right, so you know, air is actually pretty good. At one atmosphere, air's dielectric constant differs uh, from the vacuum's dielectric constant, which is one with an infinite number of zeros after it, uh, sort of at the level of 0.05% or so. So air is a bit of a dielectric, and that's why uh, you, can, you can put air in between two plates of a capacitor, and it works fairly well. But you don't always want to have to keep increasing the area of the plates or, the set or decrease the separation of the plates to get your capacitance up. If you want to custom build a capacitor, you may want to use other materials to improve your capacitance. So polystyrene, paper, transformer oil, transformers I mentioned before for changing voltages. There's an oil you can, that, that's present in that. You can use that. Uh, Pyrex, Pyrex glass cooking glassware, okay? So it's a kind of glass, ruby, mica, porcelain, silicon, germanium, ethanol, water at different temperatures, and uh, you know, these are the really good ones, right? So like ceramics, so these, uh, these uh, nice ceramics that are built for air aircraft and, and cars and things like that. Uh, strontium titanate, you know, that's got a huge dielectric constant. So where does this come from? Um, where this comes from is this picture. If you picture materials as being formed from you know, they're made from atoms, right? And atoms build up into molecules. And so the fundamental building block of all material that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is atoms. And that material contains equal numbers of positive and negative charge. And it's usually just that they're so close to one another that everything appears pretty much electrically neutral unless you get very close to an atom. Well, if you were to expose a material like water, right? We did this. Uh, I can do it again, but um, if I have, I do. Hey, look at that. Just carrying this crap around with me now. All right, so you can expose a perfectly electrically neutral material. And I might even be able to. You're going to have the pleasure of seeing some of your faces on screen, okay? So uh, if we charge this up, I can create a, a very non-uniform electric field from this around the cylinder, and I can bend the water stream using that. And that's because water is a little dipole. Its positive charges and negative charges are slightly separated from one another, okay? And the consequence of that is that when I expose them to a non-uniform electric field, I can... Um, 
I can get them to rotate and accelerate at the same time. So the uh, oops, let's go back to the dielectric. There you are. So if you think of materials as always having the, having the possibility of having their equal amounts of negative and positive charge separated by exposure to an electric field, that's the basic building block of dielectrics. Any material, in principle, you shove it in the presence of an electric field, and the little dipoles, the little atoms or molecules, their charges will move away from one another, but if they're bound to one another, they won't go very far. Okay, so atoms are held stable by the Coulomb force, and that Coulomb force is quite strong. Okay, so if you put atoms and molecules in an, an external electric field, they will separate a little bit uh, and then line up, like good dipoles in an electric field. And that's basically what's going on. And because you're now separating the charge and making these dipoles line up with their positive ends to the right and their negative ends to the left in the electric field, um, they begin to diminish the external electric field. They weaken it. And by weakening it, they allow you to store more charge on the capacitor. In order to get more electric field into the capacitor to oppose the battery, you must put more charge on the capacitor to create a stronger electric field. So by shoving some glass into an air-filled capacitor, you can greatly increase the amount of charge that can be stored there because in order to get the same electric field through that glass, you have to put a lot more charge on the plates for the same voltage. Okay? So uh, that's the basic operating principle of dielectrics. Now, where this goes south is when you put such a strong electric field on the material that you actually overcome the Coulomb force that holds atoms and molecules together and tear chemical bonds apart, or even ten tear atomic bonds apart. Now you've separated the charge and you've freed them from one another, and now they will move, and they will move fast, and you can turn a dielectric into a conductor by doing that, but you'll irrevocably change the material. Okay, so uh, lightning strikes are a good example of how you get lots of charge built up in the clouds, uh, an equal but uh, magnitude but opposite sign charge built up in the ground in response to the electric field between the cloud and ground system. So thunderstorms are giant capacitors. And if you have parallel thunderstorms that come together, what happens to the capacitances? They add. <laughs> and you get a bigger capacitor capable of storing even more charge. So you begin to see why it's important to think about this stuff. If you have storm systems merging, get, get the hell out of the way because you do not want to be around when that electric field overcomes the dielectric constant of air and breaks it down. That's what causes lightning strikes. And those things will kill you, okay? Or set things on fire, or both. And that leads neatly into electric current. So in the last few minutes of class, let me motivate what we're going to do next and start to begin to define some very basic terms. This is a beautiful, pristine loop of conductor in the top. And it's copper colored because a lot of conductor that's commonly used is the metal copper. And you'll see why as we go into resistance and resistivity in the next lecture. So you have this little loop of, cur of uh, conductor, no sources of voltage whatsoever, perfectly electrically neutral when it's just sitting there. Absolutely nothing interesting happens. This is about as boring as it gets. Now, if you were to clip the copper, take out a section, and plug a battery in, now you've put an electric potential difference into the circuit. And again, the plus end of the battery here, the minus end of the battery here, this is the source of positive charge, okay? And it will try to go around and get to the negative side of the battery. The chemical reaction inside the battery will then shuffle charge back from the negative side to the positive side, and the whole thing will repeat. So you can think about this, you know, the battery is, if you're thinking about a water analogy as if you were driving a flow of water through a pipe, this is the pump. And the pump gets the water back in from the other side. It uses some source of energy, in this case a sustained chemical reaction for a battery, to drive the charge back up to high potential and then drop it down again. Okay? So uh, the, the idea here is now that you, you're no longer thinking about charges just sitting there. We already started to get into the movement of charge a little bit in my video lecture. Uh, but now we're really going to start thinking about what's going on when you move charge. And a couple of important things come into play. So you have this symbol I, and I is what is known as the electric current. It is just, if you were to slice through this conductor and just count the charges that go by, 
you know, oh, one, one, one charge, another charge, uh, there goes a third, there's a fourth, there's a fifth. And then you divide the amount of charge that goes by in, say, 10 seconds. That would give you the electric current. It's just the amount of charge that passes a fixed point in, in the system in some time. So delta Q over delta T, or dQ over dT, if you're talking about a continuous distribution of charge. Okay? dQ over dT is current, I. That's it. Coulombs per second. Nothing magic about it. And that uh, gets a nice name. That gets its own unit. You know, when you do a lot of important work in a field, you can get a unit named after you. That's A, right? So, because there ain't a lot of money in science, so you got to get something. Uh, the ampere, uh, which is named after somebody we'll meet later in the course, uh, the amp, A-M-P. Uh, one ampere is one coulomb per second, okay? So uh, we'll pick that up next time, and we'll talk about the fact that that material is not perfectly allowing the passage of the current. It comes at a cost called resistance. Thanks, everybody. And again, just in case.